pieces on the board for you, and you'll need them both. We're going to flip between them. Uh, at one point, we'll, we'll start in Acts 6, then we'll go to Exodus 18, then we'll return back to Acts chapter 6. So you are going to need both bookmarks as we go through the study today. But what a fitting uh, place to be last week with the baptisms and, and remembering who it is who it is that we are. Just, just be who you are. Uh, don't be ashamed of the king. Wear it loud and proud. Uh, he, he loves you, and, and we do not deny the one who gave everything to save us. But with that identity, with that identification with the king, there are consequences. The world is not going to accept us. It didn't accept him first. So as we tangibly did that, Last week with the baptisms, we're going to look at an instance of that here in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. So I'm going to start reading in verse 5. I'm going to read down to verse 8. We have read these verses before, but we're going to read these verses down to verse 8, and we'll see where the Lord takes us today. So Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 5. The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, And Philip, Procurius, Nicodor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid hands on them. The word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. For our past few studies, we have looked at this moment in Acts where the first deacons are chosen. We slowed down. We looked at the qualifications for the deacons as well as some of the differences between what a deacon is and what an elder is and how they operate within the overall government of the church. As the apostles laid all of this out before the early church, the decision by the apostles was greeted with approval by the body. And this moment is an example of what we will see when we reach Ephesians chapter 2, that the apostles have a foundational authority that is not available to Christians in the church today. That as part of their responsibility, what God has given to them, has given to the apostles in the early church, is the ability to lay the foundation for the rest of the church, with that foundation being built upon one chief cornerstone, that cornerstone alone is Christ. Then Christians who come after them will build a building on top of that foundation. They will come and they will come to the foundation already laid down by the apostles and the building, the body of Christ, will be built upon that. Now Paul will explain this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. That it is his work as an apostle to lay the foundation with Christ as the cornerstone. And then someone will come after him, after Paul, and they will build up the body of Christ on that foundation that Paul laid down. Paul even gives a warning to those who come after him. Make sure that whatever building you're building, you only build it upon this foundation that has as his cornerstone Jesus. Do not build on anything else. Now, this is part of the great danger for those groups who claim in our modern day that their relationship with God is based on some kind of secret knowledge, some kind of special revelation that was not known until now. That for almost 2,000 years, nobody knew about these super secrets that we know, but we know about them now, and you need to listen to us. And there's groups like the Mormons or Islam who claim some affinity or relationship with the God of the Bible that we serve, but then they also tell us this, that they didn't have the full revelation back then, not when Jesus walked the earth. That didn't happen until later, until hundreds of years later, if, if not almost 2,000 years later, and then some angel or some prophet came to us and gave us special inside information now. And with this special hidden knowledge, they are building on a foundation that is not solely built upon Christ. Rather, they built it upon this new, deeper knowledge that only their group happens to have. Secret knowledge, secret Bible codes is not how the Bible works. All the truths of God are out there in the open. He doesn't hide any of his truths. It, it, everything is right there in black and white, so it kind of works like this. Have you ever read a passage like multiple times over the years, and then just this one time you read it, and there's something there that pops off at the page to you, and the first thought you think to yourself is, how did I never see this before? It's so obvious. 
It's right there. I didn't have to put the pages together or turn it upside down. It was clearly in the page the entire time. So why didn't I see it? The issue is not the word and the issue is not God. The issue is us. We weren't ready. We weren't ready for whatever that truth is. He was still working things out in us so that we would be ready for the truth that he wanted to proclaim. The truth is never hidden. And we see this in Acts chapter 6 as the proclamation of the apostles in Acts chapter 6 is not some seedy backroom deal. They don't bring an issue to the apostles. They go into the backroom and then the 12 apostles and seven deacons suddenly come out. Instead, the proclamation is before the entire church. Everybody knows it all at once. They tell them what their decision is. The body hears it and they recognize the wisdom of their words. Now, in verse 5, the body immediately sets out to start choosing the first seven deacons. And we see their names in verse 5. We should note, first name on that list is Stephen. We're going to see a lot about Stephen in the next chapter, in chapter 7. After him is Philip. Philip will be a big part of chapter 8. Very important. We'll even see him later on in the book of Acts as well. But for the other five, we know nothing biblically. After this moment that they're listed, they disappear from the book. They are not mentioned again. But this does not detract from who these servants are. Because instead we have this wonderful message that speaks so well of them. That these are five servants who were chosen and recognized by the early church, but they went on to live quiet lives of service and faithfulness to the Lord. In the worldwide body of Christ, there's only going to be a couple of Spurgeons. Only one, maybe two Billy Grahams. But the vast majority of us will live lives completely unnoticed by the world. Yet every single breath that we take is precious to God. You may feel that nobody sees you. Nobody sees the sacrifice that you take. How you pour out for his awesome name and nobody takes notice. God's notice. In fact, he says that even the hair on your heads are numbered. That's how precious you are to him. So when you go out to live your life, live it pleasing to God. He's the only one who sees everything. Don't worry about living a life that's pleasing to men. In verse 6, the first seven deacons are brought to the apostles. And after praying, they lay hands upon the deacons, which is a public acknowledgement of their office, and it is their, their being formally charged with the role that they would walk into. There is no special power happening in the laying on of hands. What it is, is it tells everybody around, this is what they are being charged to do, but take special note of the sequence. First, they pray, then they lay hands. It's not the other way around. You don't lay hands on somebody and choose them for a role, and then you pray and hope for the best. That's not the way it goes. You pray and you seek God's wisdom. First, they seek the will of God and his blessing, and then they acknowledge the choice of God. It is important that the apostles don't even take the body's word for it. They told him, right? You guys go and figure out a couple of people that you trust, good reputation, full of truth, full of the Spirit. And they go and they go, these are the ones we've chosen. And then they bring them before the apostles and the apostles don't go, looks good to me. And they just go with it. They stomp and they pray. They confirm the choice with the Lord. They don't solely trust the body to determine what's best. And it's not because they're micromanagers. It's not because they can't trust the heart of the church. Is because they know the buck stops with us. We discussed this previously, right? God chose me to be an under-shepherd. And I don't get to vacate my responsibility by passing that responsibility on to you. My days would be so much easier if I could just let you guys kind of fend for yourselves and then look at God and go, well, you know these people. This is the choice they made. But that's not the, the way it works. That's not the way accountability and responsibility works. I don't get to vacate my job by passing that job on to you. And part of the burden is the thoughtful and considerate laying on of hands. This is something that Paul is going to warn Timothy about. After Paul explained the qualifications for elders and deacons, he warns Timothy in, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, he says, and don't be in a rush. Don't be quick to put this authority on whoever it is that you meet. But we all know patience is hard. So often we're in a rush. So often I'm in a rush. I feel the pressure of the moment, the need to get things done. And rather than wait on God to move according to his perfect timing, 
I feel this need to kind of help God along. He's moving too slow for me. God, don't you know I have a timetable to keep? And for many people, this is the most frustrating part of this particular church. Now, we try. We don't always do it right, but we try. We really do try to move at the speed of the Spirit of God. If he moves, we move. If he stops, then we stand still. It's the lesson of Israel in the wilderness in Numbers chapter 9. When they saw the column, the glory of God starting to move, they moved. But when the, the glory of God just stayed put, what did they do? They set up camp and they stayed. We understand this. We follow the Lord, not the other way around. And for a lot of people, it feels like we're doing nothing. But we're not doing nothing. We're waiting. We're seeking. We're praying and we're desperate to know what it is that he wants us to do next. And we trust that our God is so awesome that he can make his will known even to dense people like me. This kind of patience and seeking God is what we see here in Acts chapter 6. There's a problem, they give them the answer, they bring forth the candidates, and they stop and pray. Is this your decision, Lord? They ask the Lord's wisdom and for the Lord's blessing, and then and only then do they lay hands upon the seven and declare them the first deacons of the church. And this seems like such a tedious process. Where did they learn this from? From the master. Because it's the same thing that Jesus does when he chooses the 12 disciples. He takes even longer. He spends all night in prayer before he goes and he picks. He had already served alongside of them, walked along with them, begun to, to teach them, called so many of them by name. And he didn't just look into the crowd and pick 12 random disciples. Rather, God the Son spent an entire night in prayer to God the Father, and all night long he prayed over this. Surrendered to the Lord, asking for the Lord to work through him, and then the next day he called the 12. This is so important because we don't ordain anyone. We don't anoint anyone. I'm telling you, there is no special power in the laying on of hands. If I place hands upon you, you don't get special power from God that can only come through me. What we do is what we see in the Bible in places like Acts chapter 13 where the Holy Spirit told the church at Antioch, set apart from me Saul and Barnabas for the work of ministry. The church fasted and they prayed. They needed to make sure they were hearing clearly the voice of God. But once they were sure, they laid hands upon them and sent them away. This is the biblical pattern for ordination because only God can anoint. Only God can ordain. And all we ever do is recognize what God has already done. With the apostles no longer this choke point in the church, the work of God could grow. They're not in the, uh, the place messing everything up. They're not standing in the doorway trying to do all the work themselves. And because there's more servants, you can entrust them with more load. Nothing is new under the sun. We see this same dynamic in Exodus 18. So if you would, turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 18. In Exodus chapter 18, we see Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses coming to visit his son-in-law. They just got out of Egypt, freed from bondage, going toward the mountain of God. And he goes and he runs up and he hugs Moses and, and they spend all night together, Moses telling him about the awesome things that God has done. And the next day, early in the morning, Moses goes to work. And Jethro goes along with them. We're told that he goes to uh, judge the people from morning until evening. The idea of judging the people means that he's going to go and be in a place where everyone can bring their problems to him, and then he is going to teach them how to apply the principles of God to their life. It's a wonderful role that Moses is entrusted with. And all day long he will do this, but it wasn't good. Just so says that in verse 17, he says, the thing that you are doing is not good. Now, the issue isn't that Moses was such a hard worker. That's a wonderful thing. And it's not that the people had so many problems. You have a group the size of like one to two million, you're going to have a lot of problems inside of the group. So that's not the issue either. The issue is this. The people thought only Moses had the answers. And that's the issue. 
It is one of the most unhealthy attitudes that can ever exist inside of this church for you to think that you need me to talk to God. That is wrong. You don't need me. You have direct access to the king yourself. And you are surrounded by saints who love the Lord just like you do. It is not good for them to think that only Moses had all the answers. He forms this choke point. Now everything else slows down. And it's not good for Moses, and it's not good for the people, and it's not good for anyone, any one person, to be the obstruction that is restricting what God wants to do. In Exodus 18, 18, Jethro tells Moses, this this workload is going to wear you out. You'll never make it. It's going to burn you up. You can't do it all yourself. You will suffer. The people will suffer. You, You simply cannot do this alone. Therefore, Exactly what we see in Acts chapter 6. Go and look for people who are already qualified. See, these aren't on-the-job training kind of jobs. You don't put them in there and then again, hope for the best. They have to already be doing it. They have to already be anointed by God. These are people who are already capable. Men who feared God. They're They're honest and they're not greedy. And then you take capable servants like this, and you place them over leaders as leaders of groups according to whatever they can handle. Some will be over thousands, some hundreds, some fifties, and some tens. But whatever they, it is that they can handle, put them in charge of that group. As we have discussed, this doesn't get Moses out of work. We don't ask for servants here so that I can go take a break. But we need servants to serve in those roles so that others can do what it is that they have been called to do. Jethro understands there are certain things that only Moses is anointed to do. He tells them this, they will handle the minor disputes, but you will handle the big ones. The big messy ones, you don't get out of those. That's just all you do from now on. They're going to handle all the ticky-tack stuff. But Moses has to do Moses' things. That's verse 22. But the other things that can be done by others, it should be done by them. There's tremendous wisdom in this word from Jethro. And Moses agrees. And it's very important that this change and this reorganization occurs right now, right here. Because in the next chapter, they're reaching Mount Sinai. And two chapters from now, chapter 20 of Exodus, they're going to receive the Ten Commandments and the law. And Moses is barely hanging on now. He can barely do what he's supposed to do now. How is he possibly going to handle all everything that's coming once they have to worry about the commandments and the law. So there needs to be a division of labor right now. Let them do what they can handle. You do what you must. Learn how to share the work now because there is no way Israel will be able to endure what comes next if you keep doing things this way. Now back in Acts chapter 6, because the apostles were not trying to do everything themselves, God is able to add to the church without crushing the servants who serve. This is the preparation for it. It, There wasn't the influx of people, and then the servants stepped up. The servants stepped up, and then there was the influx, because God could entrust them with more. We see the same thing with the the kings later on, that, that God wanted to send them water, but they needed something to hold the water, so they had to dig the ditches to hold the water, but no water came until the ditches were dug. Verse 7 shows us what God wanted to do here in Acts 6. He wanted to increase the church greatly. And not only with with, uh, uh, the rank-and-file common folk, if you will, but even the priests who served in the temple, many of them will come to a saving relationship with Christ. This is a huge shift in Jerusalem. It's like an earthquake shaking the entire city. It is one thing for Gentiles to get saved. It's one thing for the common folk and the people out in the country. Eh, Let them have their thing. But it is totally different if priests who are serving in the temple started to see Jesus as the Messiah. And such a development will bring a lot of passion and a lot of scrutiny, and that attention will focus on one very special man, starting in verse 8. Look at verse 8 with me, please. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, And some from Cilicia in Asia rose up and argued with Stephen. But they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses 
and against God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. They put forward false witnesses who said, this man incessantly speaks against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. In verse 5, we've already seen the description of Stephen. He was full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit. And because of his faith and trust in God, his surrender to the Holy Spirit, he was filled up with grace and Holy Spirit power because he could be trusted. And because he could be trusted, he was entrusted to perform great signs and wonders before the people. But along with empowering comes responsibility to faithfully declare the gospel because that is the purpose of signs. The purpose of signs is to direct all people to the Savior so that the gospel of Jesus can save their souls. The purpose of signs and wonders is never to glorify us, even though it will get us attention. It is never to gather more people so more signs can be done. Signs are not performed so you can do more signs. That's not the purpose of them either. It is not to make our lives in this world more comfortable. Sadly, that is the lesson that has been taught to so many. But all its signs exist to further the gospel message. And as we will see through chapter 7, Stephen will be totally faithful to that charge. Now in verse 9, we see that the message of Stephen was not appreciated by all the people. And members of the synagogue of the freedmen stood up when they heard Stephen's words and began to argue with him. And the, with the gospel message that he was trying to share. Now when you see this mention of the synagogue of the freedmen, we know very little about this group. Historically, archaeology, we have this tiny little hint that maybe, just maybe, this was a synagogue formed by Jews who were freed at the end of the Greek Empire and the beginning of the Roman Empire. So somewhere right around there, some of the Jews from the, the northern coast of Africa came together and they formed Jewish synagogues. So these people that we see here are, are most likely not the, those direct people, but their, de, their descendants. Verse 9 tells us that the Jews of the synagogue who were arguing with Stephen were from Cyrene, so that's modern-day Libya, Alexandria, which is in Egypt, and Cilicia and Asia, which are both references to modern-day Turkey, which, fun fact, Cilicia is a region. It's not a town. It's a region of southern Turkey. And one of the most prominent towns in southern Turkey is a city by the name of Tarsus, which is where the Apostle Paul is from. The men in the synagogue were arguing with Stephen about who Jesus was and what he came to do. That's verse 14. But as they argued, they came to realize we're not able to prevail against this man's arguments. Verse 10 puts it this way, but they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Now, as Christians, this should make us stand up and shout, because this is encouraging to us. The winning argument of Stephen had nothing to do with Stephen. This is the Spirit of God working through the servant of God, and it's what Jesus told us what, what would happen in Luke chapter 12. He said, one day, my followers are going to have to, they're going to be brought before synagogues and rulers and authorities, but don't worry about what you will say. For the Holy Spirit who is with you and will fill you will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. There's such hope and beauty inside of that promise. Imagine the, the daunting pressure of having to stand before people and declare what it is that God has placed within you and how many of us have felt that pressure and, and the sweat and the anxiety that starts to pop into us because we're trying to figure out the words that I'm going to say. I just don't want to mess things up. I want to do things well. And God tells you, don't worry about it. I will teach you in that moment what it is that you need to say. This is not an excuse to be lazy, but it is a command to not fear. We still have a responsibility. We have to fill our hearts with the words of the Savior because the Holy Spirit can bring to our remembrance what we haven't already placed in our heart. But if you have placed his words into your heart, then at the time that you need them, he will bring them back. And he will use you to glorify the king. 
But sadly, so many Christians get it backwards. They don't study the Bible until they're hurting. They don't start to pray until they're in pain. It's too late to learn how to swim when you're in the middle of the ocean. Learn how to swim when you're still in the kiddie pool. Learn how to swim there, not in the middle of the storm. In verse 11, we see the storm. As the Jews of the synagogue of the freedmen began this defamation campaign against Stephen, claiming that Stephen was speaking words against Moses and against God, this is a very serious accusation for the Jewish people. We see the full accusation in verse 14, right? They say that Stephen was teaching that this Nazarene, which is a nice little dig at the humble beginnings of Jesus, the hometown that he lived in, you know, that guy from way out in the sticks. Stephen's claiming that Jesus is going to destroy the temple and alter the customs that Moses had handed down. Again, nothing new under the sun. This is the same thing they accused our Lord of. He's accused of not wanting, or wanting to destroy the temple and then he would rebuild it in three days. Even though John 2, 21 tells us he was talking about his body on the cross. And the religious elite thought Jesus was trying to nullify the law of Moses. But Jesus explained that the law would not pass away until it was all fulfilled. He didn't come to demolish it. He came to fulfill it. And in the same way that the master was persecuted, the servant, the servant's going to be persecuted too. Because this is what it means to be a servant of Christ. It means to suffer as he suffered. It means to take up your cross daily and follow him. And if we look at all like the king... They're going to treat us the way they treated him. Amy Carmichael was a missionary who served 55 years in India. It was her heart's work to save women and children from poverty and from prostitution. In India at that time, it was common for children to be left at Hindu temples. You had too many kids, you would just leave the extra ones there, and you would call it a devotional offering to your pagan gods. There, the temple would do whatever they wanted to do with them. You're not around anymore. And it became her life's work to save those precious kids. But an Irish woman living in India, work like this was very hard. And out of her experiences, Amy Carmichael wrote this poem. Hast thou no scar? No hidden scar on foot or side or hand? I hear thee sung as mighty in the land. I hear them hail thy bright ascended scar. Has, star, hast thou no scar? Has thou no wound? Yet I was wounded by the archer spent, leaned me against a tree to die, and rent by ravening beasts I, that compassed me. I swooned. Has thou no wound? No wound, no scar? Yet as the uh, master shall the servant be, and pierced are the feet that follow me. But thine are whole, can he have followed far, who has no wound, no scar? Father, we love you. 